Uh, good morning, everybody, and thank you for being here. My name is JC Cortez, and I'm the Director of Training and Development here at Synergia's Metropolitan Parent Center. Uh, we're happy to have you this morning and happy to have everyone joining us on Facebook as well. Uh, this meeting is being recorded, this webinar is being recorded, and it will be available on Facebook as soon as we're done. Um, before we get started, just a few words on who Synergia is. Synergia is a multi-service agency located in Manhattan that has been serving and supporting New Yorkers with disabilities and their families for more than 40 years. We offer a rich source of information and training tailored for parents, including parents whose primary language is not English or who they themselves have special training needs. Uh, we help them participate more effectively in their children's education and development, and we partner with professionals and policymakers to improve outcomes for all children with disabilities. Uh, Synergia, which is Spanish for Synergy, uh, is one of New York City's three federally funded parent centers committed to serving people with disabilities and their families with an added focus on communities of color and the economically disadvantaged. We create innovative programs, programs, excuse me, ranging from transitional housing for homeless families who have children with disabilities and parenting and education advocacy training for parents of children with disabilities. Uh, you will receive a copy of the presentation and the PowerPoints uh, that we present today, as well as a link to this recording. Uh, so you will get that as soon as uh, as soon as we complete this. Um, if you have any questions, please put them in the Q and A or the chat window. We'll be uh, monitoring those throughout the time, and. Um, and yes, and if you have any specific case specific questions, please, for the sake of privacy, you know, reach out to us directly or maybe to our presenter. Um, but yes, and it is a great morning here in Harlem, as you can hear, right? <laughs> um, I want to introduce my colleague, Miriam Chartowell, uh, who is here. She is a housing advocate for uh, here at Synergia, and my colleague, Suhali Mendes. Uh, from the New York Lawyers for Public Interest. A uh, few words on Suhali. Suhali is a senior advocate in the Disability Justice Program at the New York Lawyers for Public Interest, where she works with individuals with disabilities who face discrimination in housing, as well as those whose language access to transportation is limited. She's also one of several staff members who staffs their intake line. Whoop and uh, Suhali assists individuals and families who need reasonable accommodations and housing by making sure that their tenants know their rights under the law and are confident in seeking enforcement of their rights. Suhali, good morning. Mariam, good morning. And uh, good morning. please. Hi, so I'm gonna give a little bit of a brief intro on the housing advocacy program at Synergia and then give it away to Suhali. Um, so, as JC had mentioned, Synergy is a multi-service agency. Part of our um, housing advocacy program involves working with the household who has one person in the household who has an intellectual or developmental disability. Um, and this way we can go ahead and work with the family on any of the housing situations uh, that they have. Housing um, issues can range from eviction prevention, rental, navigating rental arrear assistance, applying for New York City Housing Connect, which is Housing Connect 2.0 now, um, while also advocating for reasonable accommodations. We've worked hand in hand with Nightly in the past um, to be able to strongly advocate. It takes two to tango, that's all I can say. Um, you know, and Nightly has done some great work, um, you know, given that they have a supervising attorney as well, who is able to, I like to say, expedite the process at times, so. I'm going to give it away to Sue Holly right now. Um, but yeah, if anybody is interested in housing advocacy services, you can always contact our intake line um, and that'll be in the chat. Thank you. Thank you, Miriam. Thank you, JC. Um, as, um, as indicated, my name is Sue Holly Mendez and I'm an advocate and New York lawyer for the public interest disability justice program, and I'm going to be presenting on reasonable accommodations. So I'm just gonna share my screen. Hopefully this will work. Okay. Okay. Does everyone see my screen? Yes. Okay, super. So I'm gonna just change the view of the screen. Sorry, it's a bit of a... Uh, learning curve sometimes with me. Definitely showing my age. Okay, great. So um, as reference, um, 
New York Lawyers for the Public Interest um, provides free legal assistance to New Yorkers since 1976. Uh, and we provide legal assistance in the four program areas, which are the following, Pro Bono Clearinghouse, the Disability Justice Program, the Environmental Justice Program, and last but not least, the Health Justice Program. I work in the Disability Justice Program, which protects and promotes the rights of individuals with disabilities. And our um, part of that program is working in the area of accessible housing or reasonable accommodations. Um, we provide know your rights training, such as this one in, on this topic. We also provide individual intake screenings to determine assistance, if any, as well as referrals, advice, and representation. And part of our um, work is collaboration with private firms for pro bono representation, which means free of charge on matters, um, on these particular matters, um, in order for us to serve more individuals within the five boroughs. And, um, a part of our model is the community lawyering model. So we work, our organization consists of attorneys and non-attorneys such as myself. And um, non-attorney staff could be advocates, social workers, as well as community organizers. And um, we will proceed. Um, before I begin, just want to give like the general um, language of please note that this presentation covers legal information, but should not constitute as legal advice. And we will begin. So the accessible housing refers to the construction as well as modification of housing in order to enable independent living for people with disabilities within their communities. That's pretty much, excuse me, that's pretty much a general definition of accessible housing. And accessible housing is covered within these um, three realms of the law, one of which is the Fair Housing Act, as well as the New York State Human Rights Law, the New York City Human Rights Law. And um, these laws are considered federal state as well as city laws. And there are similarities between the federal and state laws. City laws do cover more rights. Um, and cases of accessibility are usually brought in within a combination of these three laws. So I'm going to go over a little bit about what each section of the law covers. So the Fair Housing Act is a federal law that protects people from discrimination on rental as well as purchasing of a home, as well as obtaining a mortgage, seeking assistance on housing and other um, related activities. And um, the protected classes in the Fair Housing Act are the, as follows, race, color, national origin, religion, sex, familial status, and disability. And um, the Fair Housing Act is enforced by the Department of Housing and Urban Development, better known as HUD. The next section is the New York State Human Rights Law, and that prohibits the discrimination on the basis of age, race, creed, color, national origin, sexu sexual orientation, excuse me, military status, sex, marital status, or disability. Um, and this applies in employment, housing, education, and credit and access to public accommodations. And this is enforced by the New York State Department of Human Rights. And this particular law defines disability more broadly. Last but not least, it's the New York City Human Rights Law. And this prohibits discrimination in employment, housing, public accommodations based on race, law, um, color, excuse me, creed, age, national origin, citizenship status, gender, sexual orientation, disability, and marital as well as partnership status. And this um, law also covers retaliation, which I'm going to cover um, in later slides, which um, covers 
bias related harassment. And this is enforced by the New York City Commission on Human Rights. And this particular law is a lot more extensive and inclusive of the three laws that I just discussed. So we're gonna dive in into accessible housing a little bit deeper. Um, before, um, one recent development is that the New York State Human Rights Law added a section which um, in legal terms is the 170D, which is considered the disclosure of disabled tenants' rights. And this um, particular section mandates that landlords give notice of tenants' rights to reasonable modifications and accommodations in housing for tenants with disability. Beginning March, 2021, which was several months ago, all new leases and lease renewals are required to include such notice. So discussion, um, description of what um, reasonable accommodation is, as well as um, uh, the rights to request it um, should be included in leases. And this will serve as a reminder to both landlord of um, what they're responsible for, as well as tenant to know that um, this is something that they can ask for. And I just wanted to you know, add this bit of an update. So obviously um, we will dive into this a little bit um, more further down. Um, if you um, or anyone that you know that, ha that has not, that had had a recent lease renewal or new lease in general, that's, that does not include this language, we would love to hear from you. Um, I will provide the contact information of our intake line at the conclusion of this presentation. So what type of housing is covered? Um, this applies to virtually all public as well as private housing. Also um, the New York City Housing Authority or NYCHA, Section 8, rent stabilized, rent control, co-ops, condominiums, market rate housing, nursing homes, and shelters. There are limitations that do apply. And those are owner-occupied buildings with no more than four units, single family housing sold or rent rented without the use of a broker, and housing operated by organization and private clubs that limit occupancies to members. So who qualifies for um, this type of housing or rights? Basically, a person with disability is considered automatically um, a qualifier. So that depends on the law that's included, which are the laws that I covered in pre um, a few slides. Um, the Fair Housing Act defines um, physical or mental impairment that um, limits one or more major life activities, while the New York City um, human rights law includes a wider range of disabilities and medical conditions, which makes more people eligible. Please note that a person with disability can be considered um, either a permanently disabled or temporarily disabled. So just keep that in mind. Because a lot of times we think disability is just a permanent state. It could be something that could be temporary as well as permanent. So I just wanted to um, point that out. So what are your rights? Um, your rights are, um, to equal access to use and enjoy your dwelling. This is applicable across the board, whether or not you have a disability. And this includes individual units as well as common, um, common excuse me, or public areas of the apartment or complex. So individual units will be considered your actual apartment if you're in a building. Common and public areas of the building or complex could be things such as the lobby, the mail room, um, if your building has amenities such as a uh, laundry space, that's um, considered um, part of the law in terms of reasonable accommodations. So those, those are like real life examples of what that's considered. Um, and reasonable accommodations are buildings, um, services, policies, procedures, and landlord bears the expense. A lot of times, you know, uh, when individuals request a reasonable accommodation, landlords could turn around and say, well, you have to pay for it. And um, 
that is incorrect. Um, if you are in a, in a unit that you're renting from a landlord, the landlord has to um, bear the expense of making a reasonable accommodation. So one of the major um, term in reasonable accommodation um, is reasonable. So what is considered reasonable? Reasonable should not be confused as best. So in reasonable accommodations, um, things that are considered to make um, an accommodation reasonable are the cost, the safety, and the architectural feasibility. So cost could be, let's say, an example of a grab bar. Um, grab bars, you know, they are um, standard grab bars. They could be a more higher end um, grab bars. If you're requesting a grab bar, let's say in your bathroom, if you have a mobility impairment, the landlord is responsible to provide what's reasonable. So it does not have to be like a top of the line um, um, grab bar. It could just be a standard grab bar as long as it does not interfere with the functionality of what it's supposed to do, which rolls into the safety of it. And architectural feasibility, this is more of a structural thing. Um, for an example, if you're asking to widen a doorway um, and um, the request for a reasonable accommodation um, is denied because of the, the doorway cannot be widened because it could be that it interferes with the architecture of the, uh, of the, of the unit. Um, things such as, um, oh, um, it will make the building or the apartment unstable. That's an example of an architectural feasibility. And that would be the lamp, it is the landlord's responsibility to deem it um, as a issue. It is not your responsibility to bear that um, burden. That is the responsibility of the landlord. So these are um, real world examples of what are barrier removals, which I'm gonna kind of go over a little bit. So the installation of a ramp to a building entrance, let's say for an individual that uses a wheelchair or a, um, a walker or any kind of aid to help them um, mobilize. Um, and there's a building that has a lobby that has a couple of steps or a few more steps or however, that um, interferes with the entrance and their safety, you can request um, that a ramp um, be installed in order to um, get in and out of the building. That's an example. Obviously, um, invest, um, re research has to be made whether or not this is are architecturally feasible, um, as I mentioned in previous slides. But um, this is something that could be requested for um, accessibility. Other things could be as widening doors, as I mentioned um, in the previous slide, in order to navigate uh, with a wheelchair if a doorway is considered too narrow. The installation of grab bars, as I mentioned previously, um, for, for someone to be able to utilize um, their bathroom, for instance, um, grab bars can be installed in the, in the bathtub or by the toilet areas to allow them to be able to utilize the space as efficiently as possible, as well as lowering um, closet rungs. If someone's in a wheelchair, you know, obviously if a closet rung is high, they won't be able to utilize that. So bringing down the closet rung will be considered a reasonable accommodation to their disability. Um, installation of chair lifts, this is applicable to stairs. Like um, obviously this is not a one size fits all approach, but Chairlifts can also be an alternate to um, be able to get in or out of, a, of an area that has stairs for someone with a mobility impairment, as well as um, ac uh, accessible toilet. There are um, ADA standards that a toilet has to sit a certain height to make it accessible, as well as an accessible shower. An accessible shower can be like a, a walk-in shower, for instance, for an individual that uses a wheelchair or has a mobility impairment that they cannot you know, be able to um, get in and out of a standard bathtub. So that's an example of an accessible shower. Um, lower doorway. This one is particularly um, in New York City, anywhere you go, any front entrance ha usually has a very heavy door. So um, which could be cumbersome for an individual with, um, that uses an aid such as a wheelchair or a cane or, or um, 
sorry, um, other aids to be able to mo be mobile. So which could be which can pose as a safety hazard. So one of the um, things that could be asked for is to lower the doorway in order for them to be able to get in and out with um, with respect to the common areas, as well as an automatic door opener. So those are several like real world examples of reasonable accommodations. Soundproofing, um, this one is um, particularly um, unique in, in, in the situation that there are individuals who have disabilities um, that impair their um, cognitive and such, and they can bear particular loud noises and such. So this is an example of requesting, uh, of requesting such a reasonable accommodation. And obviously each matter and each situation is unique in nature. So um, these are some examples. Um, other examples which are not listed here, let's say if someone has um, a hearing impairment or is considered deaf, uh, the installation of a smoke, uh, a standard smoke alarm, they probably won't be able to hear it um, because in the event of a fire, so uh, an installation of a smoke alarm that flashes, for instance, will be better suited for an individual who has a hearing impairment or is considered deaf. So those are um, other examples of a, a reasonable accommodation within their unit. Because again, safety is key, as well as equal access to their dwellings, uh, either within their units or within common areas. So that is key here. So uh, other examples of reasonable accommodations include changes to the building policies and procedures. So things such as accessing, um, being able to access parking spaces without lengthy wait lists. If your building has like a parking garage or, and you require a, a space, a parking space um, with regard to your disability needs, you can make a reasonable accommodation in requesting this. And, um, and sometimes these situations could include a lengthy wait list. So a reasonable accommodation can perhaps expedite that process. And um, I'm going to go in, into, into how to request a reasonable accommodation in just a bit. Other things such as service animals or support animals. Um, this is particularly in situations where um, there are buildings that have like a no pets policy. And um, in the event that you have a service animal or emotional support animal, these are not pets. These are animals that work for the person. So this is a um, reasonable accommodation as well. Other things include such as accessible communications from landlords or management company for notices. That An, an example of that could be if someone is um, visually impaired or blind, um, and they request a reasonable accommodation of having the maybe the lease or other um, notices of the building to be emailed to them so that they be um, are able to access that information through um, the reading softwares, for instance. Um, because obviously, handing a hard copy over to an individual who has um, such disability will be virtually useless. So, requesting this information by email electronically, for instance, would better be suited um, for this type of um, individual. And um, this is a, a reasonable accommodation. Other accommodations could be um, transferring to a lower floor. Um, this could be in the situation like if, you, um, if an individual lives in a walk-up building, um, we have a lot of those, especially with um, older structures in New York City that there are work, there are work um, walk up buildings. And if someone becomes disabled, because that's one thing um, we have to consider disability could hit any one of us at any time. This is not always, you know, predicted in situations as people age, they can become, you know, they could present with health issues, which could in fact um, make them disabled. So disability can hit any one of us at any time, at any point of our lives. So if someone say has lived in this walk up apartment for 10, 20 years, and all of a sudden find that, you know, they have issues with their mobility and can't go up those stairs, 
as they did before, they can request a reasonable accommodation of having, um, of requesting a lower floor apartment, for instance. So that is uh, considered a reasonable accommodation request. So discrimination, and in the context of housing account and reasonable accommodations and housing, uh, I'm going to discuss what discrimination is. Discrimination is such a hot term and such a broad term, but in, in the context of housing and reasonable accommodations, it is the failure to request a reasonable, um, to provide, excuse me, a requested reasonable accommodation. And this is, let's say if you request a reasonable accommodation through your, um, to your landlord, and they explicitly refuse or do not respond within a reasonable amount of time, that is considered a discriminatory act. I, I know there are in instances where individuals will call um, my office and say, oh, I requested a reasonable accommodation of X um, about 10 years ago um, to my landlord and they never responded. That already is a red flag for us and that is, um, that no response is pretty much a response of, of, of not being able, of not providing the requested reasonable accommodations. Excuse me, let me just. Also um, discrimination is the failure to meet design and construction requirements for newer construction buildings. So buildings that are constructed, I believe um, after, early 90s, sorry, either 91 or 93, are have to have um, requirements to make it more accessible. So for newer structures that don't, um, that fail to have these um, designs in mind for accessibility, that um, that is considered a discriminatory act in itself, as well as the outright exclusion based on disability and the outright exclusion based on source of income. So what that, those last two points mean, let's say you're seeking um, an apartment and um, the landlord will say things like, uh, we don't take uh, um, at people with X disabilities. That's already um, a discriminatory, that, that's already a red flag and is considered a discriminatory act. Um, source of income, that, that could be things like, um, excluding someone or negating someone housing based on, let's say, um, if they have like a Section 8 voucher, for instance, and saying, oh, we, um, I know older apartment ads used to have things such as um, no Section 8. Um, that is discriminatory and that should not be practiced, even though, you know, we may see it every now and then. So that is considered discriminatory. So now that we covered the nuts and bolts of what discrimination is, what the laws cover, and what um, the definition of what laws cover what, we're going to talk about enforcement of your rights. So the enforcement of your rights is you can request a reasonable accommodation. You can send a letter to your landlord and include, um, obviously this is a very individual choice, include to the level of your comfort of your disability or medical condition. You don't have to spell out your whole medical history. You could just say, hey, landlord, I have this mobility impairment. You don't have to say, oh, I have this mobility impairment due to X. You know, you could just state the fact of what, why you're requesting a reasonable accommodation. And that is stating, oh, I have issues um, with mobility or, ha or I have um, a hearing, hearing impairment or I have a visual impairment. You don't have to go into your whole medical history. Um, the next point is specifying the reasonable accommodation. So your role um, as is to indicate what is the reasonable accommodation you're requesting. You can't just say, oh, I'm, I mean, you can, but it will be a harder sell. You, can, you have to state that um, what exactly you're requesting. It's not enough to say, oh, I'm requesting a reasonable accommodation because I have a mobility impairment because that's so broad and that's gonna, you know, pretty much put so much power on the landlord. You wanna take some of that power and requesting, hey, I need a grab bar in my bathroom. That's a, a specific example of what you're requesting due to your mobility impairment, for instance. Uh, another point we often emphasize is it, make sure, to, if possible, within a level of your preference, include a letter from your medical provider 
confirming your disability and or medical condition, as well as the accommodation that you're requiring. A lot of times, you know, if there is um, paperwork supporting what you're requesting, it will make it um, that much harder for the landlord to explicitly refuse your request. And in, in terms of um, my organization, our, our, you know, our role legally, you know, if we're requesting proof of your requests to your landlord, you know, it's, all, it's often good to have a paper trail and, and supporting documentation in the event we have to um, enforce these rights legally. So if possible, um, include a letter from your medical provider. One thing I have to say is since disability could be progressive, it's often better than not to have a, up, you know, a, as up to date of um, information from your medical provider as possible. What that means is you, um, it would be ideal if you could, let's say if you're requesting a reasonable accommodation, having a letter from your um, medical provider within the last six months, for instance. I often say that because sometimes I'll have individuals say, oh, I, I, I sent a letter to my landlord requesting a reasonable accommodation and a letter from my doctor dated three years ago. Like a lot can happen in the realm of three years. It could be that your disability gets better or worsens with that span of time. So ideally, um, the closer to the timeline that you're requesting this accommodation, that that um, doctor, um, that letter from your doctor or medical provider is dated, it, um, the, the um, better chances of having that reasonable accommodation um, increases. So another, so the letter basics, um, you don't have to write like a, 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 a thesis, you know, it could be something to the effect of what is it that you need? Um, why do you need it? How would the accommodation you are requesting help you as well as confirmation with your doctor? from your doctor if possible. So quick example, based on other examples that I've used, what do you need? I need a, uh, I need a, a grab bar in my bathroom. Why do you need it? In order to be able to, um, to use the bathroom as efficiently and independently as possible. How would the accommodation you are requesting help you? It would allow me to be as independent as possible. And you know, having that information from your doctor if applicable will help um, the, the chances of the landlord to provide this reasonable accommodation. So there are cases, of course, ideally when we make a request, we would love you know, for everyone to say, okay, this is happening, we're gonna do this. But you know, there, are, there are situations where um, requests are ignored or denied. Otherwise, um, you know, we wouldn't have to do things um, to seek legal recourse. Um, so what if your requests are denied or um, outright ignored? You have um, the following options. You can file a complaint with an administrative agency, um, which are HUD, the New York City Commission on Human Rights. You can also file a lawsuit through state court or federal court. And um, there are considerations um, before deciding what, um, what channels to go to, what laws you have claims over, whether or not your request is an emergency, and whether or not you have access to an attorney, as well as statutes of limitations. So ideally, if you are going to go this realm, you would, you know, seek legal representation to, or, you know, just get a, a lawyer to kind of give you guidance of what your options are, if you decide to go through this route. So what happens after I file? So if you were to file um, a complaint or a, a, um, a lawsuit, there will be an appropriate investigation by the agency or discovery in lawsuit. And if there's a judge or an, another decision maker um, involved that finds discrimination, they can order the reasonable accommodation and or policy modification um, as well as requiring anti-discrimination policy, requiring trainings for landlord and staff, and awarding monetary damages for emotional or other harm. So I just wanna highlight this last point. I know we live in an overly litigious society. Um, when you're requesting monetary damages, this is um, obviously a lawyer will have to consider this to, um, to see if this is something 
appropriate. And not all laws are, um, allow for monetary damages. Um, so you could request, um, let's say, if you had a, a very egregious experience with um, building staff based on your disability, you can request uh, like a disability sensitivity training for, build, uh, for the landlord, super staff and uh, within the building so that they could be a little more um, cognizant of disabilities. Um, other things of having the building um, have an anti-discrimination policy and, you know, just generally um, having the reasonable accommodation delivered, the very thing that you requested in the first place. So this is, this is a, another option. It's, you know, I know there are, this is a time commitment and a lot of times, you know, folks get um, discouraged, but, you know, if this is something you need, I definitely encourage you to um, learn more about these options and seek, and, and seek assistance wherever applicable in order to enforce your rights. It is your right under the law. So just wanted to underscore that. So what happens if your landlord retaliates? There are situations where, you know, yes, um, we've heard situations where like if someone um, files a complaint, for instance, they will have to notify the landlord. And there have been situations where the landlord or the super or anyone may retaliate against a tenant and making their life for lack of a better term, um, very difficult. And that's considered retaliation. And under the New York City Commission on Human Rights Law, that is, um, that is against the law. That is a discriminatory act. And you, if you find that um, there is a retaliation based on a complaint that may have been filed, you can definitely file another complaint or lawsuit alongside your original claim to address um, the retaliation retaliation claim because retaliation is against the law. Um, not that it won't stop folks from doing it, but this is in fact a right that you have, and you can enforce that right. So here, the recommendations are: if you find that um, you or anyone you know may need um, assistance on um, reasonable accommodations. Or as I said before, um, if you have a, received the lease after March 2021, that does not include the language of reasonable accommodations within that document, um, we would love to hear from you. Um, we have an intake line um, where our office is currently open virtually, but we are open, we're staffed. Um, we are open Monday through Friday from 10 a.m. to 3 p.m. Um, our contact information is listed at 212-244-4664. Um, we provide full legal representation as well as brief legal advice and referrals if applicable. So even if we cannot help you, we will refer you to the right organization that can assist you as well as self-help materials. If we find that you know, we have any materials such as fact sheets that we could provide to you in any of the areas that we cover, we will give you that information as well so that you have that information on hand to better um, equip, you, equip you and educate you of your rights. And we provide interpreters on, on phone and person as needed in all languages. We also um, accept relay calls. And um, we do not consider immigration status when deciding whether or not to help you. That is, you know, we do not um, turn away folks based on their Im um, immigration status. So I just wanted to emphasize that point too. And um, if for some reason you want to learn more about housing or, you know, this stri strikes according, you just want to learn more about the laws within housing, these are some links. Um, with fair housing, um, fair housing Matters in New York. Uh, this includes overviews, surveys, events, and invitation for updates. So these are some good resources to learn more about fair housing laws. There's also a, um, a report that was, I believe, released last year, which includes the Where We Live report, um, which is a report that they do every decade based on the housing needs of New Yorkers. So if this is something you wanna delve into a little bit more, just to learn more about your rights within New York um, and your housing, 
Um, these are some links. I mean, I'm sure there are other links out there, but these are the links we recommend you look into further. So with that, um, we will address questions, I think, towards the end. Um, one thing before um, I turn it over to my colleagues is um, any questions that um, we are, um, that are asked here, I just want to emphasize, while I am not a lawyer, um, I am abided as, a, as an employee of a legal organization to um, confidentiality, which means um, I won't be able to answer any specific individual legal um, matters in this type of setting. Um, so if I, if I happen to, if there any, excuse me, if there are any questions directed to me that kind of um, goes down that path, I will definitely ask you to either call myself or my colleagues at Synergia for further assistance. So um, just wanted to, you know, we will answer general questions, but anything specific, um, unfortunately, this is not the place. Uh, we will, you know, we'll be more than happy to take matters within our intake, respective intake li lines. So thank you so much. This is um, again where my organiz my organization name and where we're located. And I thank you all for your time. So I'm gonna stop sharing my screen here. Hopefully I do this right. Okay. Thank, thank, thank you, you so much, Holly. Thank you. All right. Well, uh, thank you. And we will be sharing out those presentations uh, shortly afterwards. Uh, but yes, if we have any questions, please, now is the time. And we might even finish early and give you some of your day back. Um, but yes, if you have any questions, please post them now in the Q&A or in the chat window. Um, and I will check on Facebook, too, to see what's going on over there. Um, but yes. Yeah, we'd be happy to address any questions. Um, having both Suhali and us and myself having um, dealt with some reasonable accommodation uh, housing issues. And I see, you know, there are some clients, some care managers. So it's a good mix of professionals and um, actual tenants and just people with disabilities in general, probably. I'm not seeing any questions. Let's see. Uh, one second. Well, in the meantime, I do want to make a shout out to another webinar that's going to be happening on August 25th. And I have put the link in the chat. If you're on our email listserv, you're, you probably already received um, the invite to this as of last yesterday in the evening. And if you haven't clicked on it, you're gonna get a reminder on Wednesday morning, um, but there will be a webinar on the New York State Emergency Rental Assistance Program, the ERAP program. So if you know of anyone who has questions about that application process, how to address, you know, not only the application process, but after having submitted um, the application, we're actually working in collaboration with Mobilization for Justice, so they're also a legal services provider. Um, and I would be excited to see all of you just getting the word out, I think is really important um, for anyone who has, just wants a general overview, but also it's a good way to connect for specific questions um, because you can be connected to the uh, supervising attorney afterwards or to the presenting attorney after the presentation. Yeah, I'm just going through the questions right now, the registration questions, um, and maybe you both can help on this. Um, if you need assistance requesting reasonable accommodation, how, how can you get that? Okay, is this on Facebook? I'm just not seeing it here, right? Uh, these are registration questions, sorry. Registration questions. How can you go about getting a reasonable accommodation? That's the so, question. Can I just chime in? Yes, and Jason. Yeah, yeah, sure. So I know I, I covered this during my presentation. So re requesting a reasonable accommodation can be um, putting it in writing, ideally putting it in writing. Uh, what, why in writing? Because a lot of times if you have conversations, you know, you don't have proof of dates, updates. Like in the event, like if you need further assistance, you know, it, it would be better to have that information in writing 
So, um, so again, it, it does not have to be a sophisticated letter. It could just be, I'm requesting a, a ramp in my building because I have a mobility impairment and providing um, supporting documentation from your medical provider, if applicable. Um, obviously, if that does not work, let's say you don't get a response or your landlord explicitly turns you down, you can call um, either my organization or center here for further assistance. And we could definitely look into what your options are. Okay. Um, do, Suhali, let me know, do, does your office help with getting section eight? We do not, we don't, um, we do not provide assistance in, in that area. But we, if for some reason, if someone finds that they're calling our organization for that, we can definitely refer them to the right place. But um, we do not provide assistance to that particularly. Okay, okay, good. And uh, let's see. Uh, I do have another question. If there's poor air quality and poor living conditions or extreme exposure to secondhand smoke forced to inhale and physically getting ill, impairment to daily living, health and safety hazard, how would you go about that? This is something that I'm curious for Suhali's input on um, just because it is something that is, it's, it's a secondhand smoke nuisance, um, but I think with the whole housing aspect of it, let's say if the tenant, um, you know, gives notice and there is a non-smoking policy um, and yet there's nothing done, you know, what, what would be next steps to escalate the situation with a non-compliant management? Right. Uh, obviously we would have to investigate this uh, in a more individual, I mean, there's no one size fits all situation for these. Um, we've gotten similar situations and we've looked into options. You know, it could be that, you know, we can contact the landlord, sometimes contacting management, for, um, seeing that there's lawyers involved might perk them up to really address situations if they haven't, if they've been slacking, you know, prior to that. But, you know, a lot of times, you know, we will definitely investigate more um, kind of do a, a, an analysis of individual matters. So all that to say is there's no one size fits all approach to this. We will, you know, we will definitely do a more thorough intake screening and request information on background, just getting a sense of how, um, how uh, if accommodations were requested, how it was asked and things of that nature. So we will, you know, that would be more in the realm of individual screening to understand more of the situation in itself. Uh, we do have a question that just came in and says, uh, if my child is ADHD and we're in a one bedroom and he needs a room of his own because of his ADHD, would that be a reasonable accommodation? Um, that's, yeah, that, Obviously, I, I, I'm not the authority of what's considered, you know, a reasonable, you know, in terms of what is a reasonable accommodation versus not. So if you're requesting a bigger apartment, you could, def, you know, definitely make um, a request for that and, you know, provide documentation from your medical provider. If for some reason you're in a rent control unit, you know, that, you know, can definitely make the situation a little more complex. So I'm not saying ask for a bigger apartment, you're going to keep the same rent. You know, that would be very careless of me to say that because that's not guaranteed. And by the law, you know, there are little intricacies in the law that preserves um, what is considered um, in terms of like rent control, rent stabilization, if that's applicable to the situation. But if you want to request a bigger unit due to a disability, you can definitely request it. But um, I just want to say, you know, what's considered reasonable accommodation, that will be determined by the attorney. I cannot make that determination, unfortunately. Yeah, I can chime in for this too and um, say that from just from feedback, I, it's always really important that it's a medical necessity. And sometimes, you know, I, I encourage families to think about it in a way where it's, what are, what are you requesting in terms of what management can do or the landlord can do, right? Um, to make your living situation more comfortable. If it's to get a larger unit, 
um, and it is a medical necessity if you have the doctor's note. After that point, like, you know, once you submit the documentation, as Suhali mentioned, it's up to the discretion of the landlord. If you're not okay with their response, there is, you know, a way to file an appeal, depending on how you're going through this. There's so many different housing situations. If, for instance, if you live in public housing, there's a specific way to go about it. Documentation is always key, though. That letter stating that it's a medical necessity, if it is, that's always going to be key. So it's a really about taking those beginning steps and then seeing how that manifests. Okay. Uh, question for you, Suhali, is uh, how do I get on the Nightly Disabilities Rights Listserv? Oh, okay. <laughs> um, you can contact our website or contact our main number, 212-244-4664, and, and request that you be added. And um, the, the staff, um, the receptionist will take down your information if applicable. Great. All yeah. right. Plug um, Nightly's website in the chat, usually all the way on the bottom of the chat. You, can, I mean, uh, sorry, <laughs> I will post Nightly's website on the chat, but usually when you visit a website all the way on the bottom, uh, there's a place for you to subscribe. I actually included it, the website. Awesome, awesome. Great. All right. Oh, perfect. Yes, uh, we do have another question. Um, who can I contact regarding this question? The ADHD, who can she contact? Should she just reach out to you directly, Suhali? You can contact our organization. We will probably do a more thorough intake um, and, and determine what advice or options are available to you. Um, because obviously, um, based on the information I've gotten, it might raise more questions for me to understand your situation better. I, I don't want to make any general um, assertions on your situation because we would need more information to determine what your options are and give you better um, indication of what the next steps look like. Great. All right. Well, uh, I do not see any other questions, um, but I did want to go ahead and make an announcement that Synergia will be in person in Jamaica, Queens this weekend for the Vitalis uh, Health Resource Fair. Um, and we'll be there from 11 to 5 on Saturday. It'll be at the Jamaica Performing Arts Center, and we will be joined by our colleagues at Include NYC and also with the Dream Unfinished Activist Orchestra, who will be performing. So um, we hope to see you there. Um, Yes, I see a question coming in about a medical condition of lupus. Uh, if it is, if you have any questions on specific something like that, then please reach out to our presenter. Or you can reach out to our organization through our intake lines, uh, and we can definitely assist you better with that. Uh, but yes, and um, seeing no other questions. Oh, wait. We do have a question. If a tenant who's a wheelchair user lives in a building whose elevators are often broken, what would their steps be to demand a renovation or a permanent solution for this broken elevator situation? That's a great question. Thank you so that, much. That is a great question. And um, one of the things you could do is request, um, definitely make a request for reparations of elevators. Obviously, you know, it's not always guaranteed. Another thing you could request if let's say um, the landlord has um, a, a lower unit available mm. so that you're not dependent on the elevator. Let's say there's a, build, uh, a unit on the second floor or the first floor even so that you, know, you don't have to rely on the elevator so much, especially if the elevator in itself is unreliable, you could request a transfer to a lower floor as a reasonable accommodation, for instance. I'm not saying that this is applicable to every situation, but that is, that is a uh, reasonable accommodation that could be requested. I don't know if, if Mariam have any other suggestions. Yeah, it's a really tricky um, situation that I've seen in terms of cases that I and families that I've worked with. Um, I think within NYCHA, it's a very, it, it takes a while to hear back, unfortunately. And when thinking of ways to escalate it, um, you know, one documentation is key being able to track it. Once you have that, it's more so a waiting game of seeing when units will become available. And I know that tenants will often doubt the transparency of 
you know, whether units are available or not available as a tenant in a building, you see people moving in, out, you don't know kind of what to go by in terms of accurate information. Um, so the best thing that I always recommend to do in these cases is to follow up with a legal service agency so that there is an avenue for um, an attorney to contact NYCHA's attorney and be able to address the situation in a way that might be more feasible. Um, you can always file a grievance with management. Uh, in previous attempts that I've made at one point, I kept faxing management and I wouldn't hear back on behalf of the household. So given, you know, trying to address it that way as filing a grievance, which really just entails, you know, putting in how many tickets, let's say uh, keeping like a, a screenshot of how many tickets um, you've had to put in for elevator repairs or how many shutoff notices, um, you know, for elevator maintenance have been put up preventing you from easily going up to your apartment. Um, making a list of that and then, you know, requesting to file that grievance can help escalate it to someone higher in management. Um, but Suhali, if, do you know of any, like, for instance, specific ADA coordinator um, in different types of, I'm thinking government settings mostly have this, but I don't think within management offices or like, you know, especially like smaller, um, you know, less than six unit buildings or homes, they won't have like an ADA coordinator to no, try to won't. address that. But um, in terms of um, addressing it with the city, do you know of any resources? I know NYCHA has, a, 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 I don't know the actual official term, but they have a liaison, a forward facing liaison that deals with disability um, based um, requests. So that, that's a way to go. Um, but I know, you know, with the bureaucracy, sometimes that could be a little bit hard to obtain. So um, in situations like this, um, I don't know if there's a general like ADA um, coordinator. So, you know, if you find that this is an issue that happens repeatedly, I definitely urge you to contact, you know, either my organization or center here or other organizations, and we can definitely um, look at your situation more closely and perhaps even advocate if, if we find it applicable, maybe we can step in and say, Hey, what's going on? What, you know, what, you know, what other measures can we take to address the situation? Cause sometimes, you know, having a third party who's kind of like not part of the situation to kind of step in and, and perhaps give some sort of assistance or possible resolution to the, uh, to the situation may, you know, may be successful at times. Yeah, I think there's a lot that can be said about that particular situation. Um, but I, I, in terms of it being permanent, that would, you know, I think the more of a paper trail that you have, the better. But um, in terms of something more permanent, like a permanent solution, that I think would require a bit of a greater force, maybe you know, filing group tenant action for an HP case. If, you know, let's say there's three elevators, but they mainly do maintenance on one, you want to keep in mind that, okay, there are two other elevators that are fully functional and operating. Mm -hmm. um, so just thinking about the situation in that matter, I think it helps to work with your local tenant association. Um, that is, if you have one, that is an opportune time to, you know, kind of like reconvene with other tenants. I know that honestly communication through that avenue I think is best in terms of uh, holding management accountable I know it's not always feasible because of scheduling and all of that but I always do encourage that another thing I would add which I addressed in my presentation is if this isn't a constant issue and you're not getting no traction from your, uh, management you can always file a complaint through the New York City Commission on Human Rights because they will investigate this matter um, and and see what other options are available. But just know when you file a complaint or do a lawsuit, you know, this is not gonna offer immediate solutions. This is a very time intensive and a commitment on your part to address the situation. Cause I know a lot of times we want things resolved yesterday. So if you were to take this avenue, just be aware that the time commitment that it, it entails. So, you know, that is also another avenue you can take. You can file a complaint, a complaint through the New York City Commission on Human Rights, 
which you can do by calling 311. So I just wanted to add that as well. Thank you for that. Uh, so uh, let me see, I don't see any more questions. Uh, I shared with you all the Vital Vitals uh, Health and Wellness Music Festival that's gonna be this weekend at the Jamaica Performing Arts Center uh, in the chat. I'm gonna just go ahead and see no other questions. I'll go ahead and activate our poll uh, survey so that you can complete that. But thank you so much for joining us. Uh, we will do the same presentation and be with Suhali again on Thursday uh, presenting in Spanish. So if you know anybody that can benefit from that, uh, please, uh, it's on our calendar and uh, we'll be here. But uh, without further delay, I just uh, wish you a happy rest of your day. <laughs>